This morning is a Bri- a Briggs Hobson, the Mississippi Senator from Essequina, Warren, Yazoo Counties, District 23. Good morning, sir. How are you doing, Mr. Chairman of Appropriations? Good morning, Paul. Glad to be with you today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I, I know a lot of things are going on. I want to go to, uh, first of all, the hospital situation, or the, rather the hospital bill that's working its way uh, into, well, the attention of both the House and the Senate. And, and tell me a little bit about this uh, this new bill that's uh, gaining some traction, uh, providing $80 million to the hospitals out there. Is that it? Uh, a little bit about this bill. Well, the bill that, that passed the Public Health Committee yesterday is a bill to, mm-hmm. uh, I would say, kind of unshackle community hospitals and, and other hospitals to be able to collaborate uh, more easily than they can right now. Uh, obviously, one of the big issues in there is whether this would be um, – Typically, this has been considered potentially uh, antitrust type um, issues, but the the language in the bill would make the hospitals immune from that kind of cooperation. Uh, It's a, you know, we could spend a lot of time, spend a whole segment or two talking about hospitals, but uh, as you know, you've got territories, you've got CONs and things Mm -hmm. of this nature that sometimes can be a problem. What we're seeing is around our state and particularly in the Delta uh, a lot of hospitals that are struggling to get by, and it would be better if we could collaborate and, you know, you cut down some of the administrative costs, you allow them to uh, not necessarily close any hospitals. I want people to be clear about that, but you could work together to run a hospital. Three or four different units could work together uh, to collaborate, and it saves money and hope- hopefully we'll keep our hospitals open for their patients and their communities. But that cannot be done without some type of legislative uh, mandate or legislative bill? I think the, the anti, yeah, from what yeah. I what I have gleaned in this discussion, and mm. actually I'll tell you, I was uh, didn't know this was coming up yesterday until just a, an hour or so beforehand. I knew there were some discussions and some research being done on it, uh, but it, this is an attempt to get them uh, quickly um, uh, able to be able to collaborate with one yeah. another. There may be some discussions. I've had, you know, since we passed the bill, I've had several different hospital folks around the state uh, contact me and say they're they're pleased with it. I haven't heard any negatives yet uh, about this, so hopefully this is going to help and alleviate one of the problems that we're having with rural hospitals. Keeps echo- echoing in my mind our uh, friends of the program who have, uh, and there are more than one, who've invested in some of these hospitals as they, they were going bankrupt or uh, defunct, and, and they've turned them around, and you ask them why. is because they're using today's practices they have to change what a hospital is and apparently they wouldn't be investing as uh, as private investors unless they were able to make some money out of these things one way or the other so uh, you you got to wonder and the number one thing Briggs is that the system itself the healthcare system is broken and if you pour 80 million dollars into a broken system and I think every taxpayer out there is going to look at every lawmaker and say wait a minute five years from now four years from now or next year once you gave $80 million, is the problem going to be solved? Well, you bring up an interesting point. When the Hospital Association presented to us, the Senate uh, Public Health Committee, um, uh, back in, I think that was November, maybe early December, they had about five points of things that they wanted to do. And one of those mm-hmm. was to excuse or forgive the hospital bed tax, which is something that, uh, and I'm not picking on the Hospital Association, but it's something they lobbied for years ago. The concern that I have, and I think many of my colleagues feel the same way, is that's a that's a one time, that's a band aid, that's not a fix. Yeah. It's going to be a band aid to the problem because we're going to be back in that same situation next year and the year after if we don't continue to do something. Now I think there are solutions. I think there are ways that we can cobble together uh, a number of things that will help out. But I couldn't agree more with what I think you were saying at the beginning: is we've got to look at the model. We've got to look at yeah. the model of healthcare yeah. delivery in our state and. I'm a firm believer that we can't use, you know, 1970s practices uh, in 2020. It's just not going to work. Yeah. And we, we've seen ambulatory surgical clinics. We've seen outpatient care change that dramatically. And we're going to have to look at that. I, I think in any legislator or anybody in the media or in, in myself who, who says, I, it's, it's not that I don't want those hospitals to remain open. It's not that I don't want better services, medical services. God understand, you, we everybody wants that. But you also want the right way to get that done. You don't want to just throw $80 million on it and to decide, okay, now it's supposed to be cured. It's supposed to be solved. And it, and it never happens. You look at the changing market, as we heard from uh, Shad a few moments ago, uh, the number of people who poured out of the small communities moved to larger communities. 
is, is just not going to abate. I mean, it continues uh, unless you have a small community next to a thriving community that's got a job market there. And the other part of that is when you do, you have more and more ambulatory services moving in that are going to compete with the hospital. So somewhere down the line, if this is going to be a failed model on one side, why the hell don't we go on and say, look, if competition wants to come in and provide that health care, then let's do away with the con proce- process, finally. Yeah, get, get to a, a place where, uh, unfortunately, we don't want to see a lot of, we don't want to see waste, and we don't want to see people get to a place. I think I heard you say this in the previous segment, that uh, when you have, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but when you have mm-hmm. something that's not working in that community, you know, people will move and people will adjust. And, and I can say it's a little bit of a chicken and egg type thing. If you don't have industry and jobs in that area, you're not going to be able to have people and therefore you're not going to have a need for that yeah. kind of medical care. Some people would say, well, you're not going to get industry and jobs unless you have some level of health care. I think a, a, a level of health care is something that we're going to look at and we're going to see and I think we're already seeing some of our rural hospitals going to opt into the rural emergency hospital model. And uh, that's going to mm-hmm. allow for uh, initial assessment, triage, if you will, for patients that are coming in to be treated. It's not going to allow for continuing uh, bed coverage. You could have swing beds, but you're not going to have beds where people are coming in to stay like the old model that you and I are talking about. That's just yeah. not going to work in some of these very rural communities. And those patients that need long term beds will go to. Uh, the more, uh, you know, the bigger cities, more metropolitan areas. So that's just, I think, it, it, have it, to was, it was a little bit disturbing to hear that one of the problems we're having, and even in some of these hospitals and even in other larger hospitals with uh, health care, is we don't have enough nurses. And then have the Nurses Association come up and say that we're turning some people away, even with a nurse's shortage, because we don't have any instructors in there. My God, how many how many instructors are we talking about in a state of about three million people? Um, is it about five million dollars that's needed? And uh, if we're talking about health care, small communities or larger communities, that seems to be something that's fixable with the right salary. Well, Paul, you'll remember last year we pumped a ton of money in for nursing care. Um, we we had several things through ARPA and through the general budget. Mm-hmm. So I think some of this is a pipeline issue, frankly. I think we've started, uh, we've opened up the valves, and we're going to start the uh, the push has already started. But it takes a little while to get through nursing school. I mean, you can't just turn it on and say, hey, here, here's nurses, and let's go to work. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to train them. Uh, we've got some even – some of the money that the community colleges are getting for actually new nursing centers. Well, that takes a couple of years to build, and then we will have to get the nurses in. So we've got work to do, but it does take time, and that's what I want people to understand. Now, we're no different than what I hear in most other states. I just got back from a national meeting, and the same thing's happening around the country. They say they need more nurses, more allied health professionals. Uh, mm-hmm. There's just a, a real need across the country. I mean, two areas we hear about, teachers and nurses, um, and we've got to start filling up the pipeline. And I think we've begun the work. It's just going to take time. Yeah. Well, I, I want to make sure you um, give us uh, some highlights of what you're working on. I know that we have things like um, uh, the the tax bill out there that's going to, going to work its way through. What's the update on that one? What's your feeling uh, as far as the personal income tax is concerned? Uh, if you're referencing the rebate, uh, I have filed a rebate right. bill again this year and, and um you know, the way I've looked at this, I look at the, the general fund money on a regular basis as much as anybody up here, I'm sure. And we certainly have more general funds than we probably have ever had. There, there are some concerns out there. And, and I think I heard uh, Chairman Reed, my, my counterpart in the House, talk about this the other day. Look, we need I, to be I want you to hold on. Hold on. We'll talk about that. Let's we got a quick break. It's coming up here and we'll talk about it. Yeah, he was talking about it. We, we ask how much the the rebates could be anywhere from you know a few bucks to a few hundred dollars it depends on how much you've paid in and the other uh, part of that was that should we take a look at grocery taxes and find a way to make the municipalities whole without hurting them but even cut the grocery tax because that would be a long-term benefit to everybody of every income certainly now when eggs are uh, the price that eggs are I, I noticed a little you bit of commonality of this Remind me to tell you a story about that. I I will do. To get the eggs and the nurses both back on the job is going to take a long time to get it done. So we have found some similarities between those two. Back more with the chairman coming up right after this. Chairman of Appropriations, Bubba Hobbs, and just to... um, 
to go off of what you were talking about as far as legislation for people who are following this, we were talking about bill. Somebody asked me what the bill is on the eighty million. It's twenty three seventy two in the Senate. And those other ones, and you are right, it's going to take time for all this to get into the system and work its way over the years. If it's passed, there's Senate Bill 2373, 2371, 2370, 2323. So those are some of the bills out there that are addressing the nurses' shortage and the hospital situation. You had a chicken uh, story. Well, I, you, you mentioned eggs, and I got home two nights mm-hmm. ago, and my wife just out of the blue said, you know, I went to the grocery store today and bought a dozen eggs, and it cost me $8. And and it was just remarkable to hear that. Now, I don't go around pricing eggs, but I asked her, I said, well, yeah. how much did you know, eggs cost? She said, well, not too long ago. They were about four or something, and go back a couple of few years, and you're talking $2 and something per carton. And, and it's remarkable inflation. And that's something, as I was kind of alluding to right before we, we took a break, is some yeah. of the clouds that are out there. And they're not really dark clouds yet, but they are clouds out there on things that we've got to look at. And every agency I'm hearing from right now talks about how inflation is hitting them. And inflation's hitting everybody. It's hitting our consumers. And that's one of the things on the tax rebate that I think is good. I mean, I hope this is a, a temporary uh, thing that we're dealing with inflation and we get back down to where we were, you know, pre-Biden administration. But uh, I think, you know, a rebate would be instant relief for some of these folks that are struggling to buy eggs like you and I are, struggling to buy milk, yeah. bread, struggling to buy all the toiletry, toiletries that they need, everything else that's so important in their lives. Bridge, do you think there's going to be any movement at all as far as the Medicaid expansion from the Senate side? I think what the hospital bills that we're looking at is is what is going to be on the table this year. I, I think that's mm-hmm. it. And you know, you referenced a couple of those. Uh, uh, you know, some some form of uh, relief. You know, financial relief. Some form of restructuring on the hospital end. Um, I think that's more of what. We, one thing I want to look at, and I've asked Dr. Edney to get me. Um, in fact, he said he is getting me a white paper on this. Is some information about how the dish payments have gone because that's that was designed to take care of um, Medicaid, mm-hmm. uh, low pay, no pay care in Mississippi. And, and uh, he and I talked about this a week or so ago. It's, we've gotten some, uh, you know, I got some troubling information, but I'm waiting to get that information so I can better assess where we are on that. This has, this has nothing to do with the, the hospital situation, but I think it's an interesting bill. Uh, it is a bill that was put forth by, do 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 uh, geez, I have it on here somewhere. Public Safety Commissioner Sean Tindall says an incident with the police in Macomb, Mississippi last year, and, and this is happening all across our state and across the nation, made it evident that law uh, enforcement must, uh, that law must be passed in our state that would put more distance between the people and police when recording law enforcement activity. This is, you could say there are constitutionalists out there on social media doing this, and I think they do it for a variety of reasons, just to get likes on social media, to to instigate a lawsuit, uh, and they know that they're in the right, so they've made money on this one. Or some of them say they just do this to to strengthen the constitutionality uh, of uh, in, in this country. And what this bill basically does and I think he said this. He said, look, you've got to stand 15 feet back, and if you want to violate this, we're going to arrest you, said uh, the commissioner. So the bill was created after a traffic stop last year in Macomb involving Mississippi Highway Patrol and other individuals at a scene uh, uh, in, in, I think, on a county road. Madison County Representative Jill Ford is the one who's introduced this bill. It's House Bill 448 is in committee right now, and it will create a safety parameter or safe parameter a perimeter when uh, law enforcement is working. One of the biggest issues we have now is that there's an arrest or just a basic traffic stop. It's individuals failing to follow the backup and give us some room. And another thing, when you can uh, cite a state law saying that you have to give me 15 feet. So basically what the commissioner wants is a law that says you can record all you want to, but you've got to give us 15 feet from the stop to operate in a safe perimeter. Your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not familiar with the bill yet, and I will discuss mm-hmm. that with Commissioner Tyndall and, and Representative Ford as necessary. But uh, I, th- I think we've got to be take reasonable measures to make sure our law enforcement officers are protected. And I can only imagine that when you go out to a traffic stop or to an incident where there's a potential violence, let's say a domestic violence situation, that 
you, you don't want anybody getting too close to you because that's when you get in serious trouble. I mean, somebody's going to maybe reach for a gun or somebody's going to get inside your yeah. your comfort zone as a, an officer. And I don't know what that perimeter is. If 15 feet's the number, I mean, I would I would defer to the commissioner or law enforcement. I, but, I don't think there is any right now at all, and that's for the reason that they're trying to set some type of um, some type of number on that. Yeah, I just I need more information, Paul. I don't want to. Uh, yeah. it's, I have not heard well, about the bill. Well, it's it's it's, it's not it. something we haven't talked about on the air. It's um it's a large number of officers who it, the, I think some of the problems are the problems are with these people who call themselves constitutionalists. And the other side is a large number of officers we have that are not trained in confrontation. And this is a relatively new thing here with the disrespect of police officers, and it causes things to get out of control. It, it's like the and I've said this before, and I don't want to be uh, redundant about this, but it's like the Miranda rights. When these officers know that they should be, there should be a standard introduction by any officer that that makes a stop, regardless of it, in a vehicle or anywhere at any time, and and that officer should be able to to quote a specific law. It's not like we don't have phones and tablets that they could have that on there. Uh, so it would stop if somebody says you don't have to roll down the window or you don't have to show me this or that. Then you have a specific law in the state of Mississippi. If not, they can't do it. Period, and stop the confrontations. Yeah. Would, would I guess the things we'd have to talk about? Does that mean you know, if I if I'm an officer and I come up to a car, mm-hmm. I start within 15 feet of the person when I ask him to come, you know, roll down their window. I would assume that it's once the officer says you need to back up 15 feet, or, or if they get out of the car, you need to be 15 feet away. I, I would think there'd have to be some directive from the officer, first of all. Secondly, is there's an ample time for that person to get yeah. away or for the officer to back away. I don't know how that would work, but I'd love to hear that from uh, law enforcement because I, I would trust that they would work this out in a reasonable manner so that it's the, the person knows uh, and the, the officer knows what his duties are to notify the person. Yeah. I, I feel for these guys because sometimes they are uh, put on the streets and, 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 and regardless of their age, some who've been there for a long time and, and culture changes and these are new, these, these are just new obstacles that they've, that, that social media has created like in a variety of other things on TikTok or Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you have to deal with it and if not, sometimes they get out of hand and the municipality is going to be sued, and that money comes out of the taxpayers' coffers, not the police officer or the police chief, and that's or the mayor, for that matter, and it's unfortunate. Some of the other things before we run out of time here that you're really concerned about are, uh, are spotlighting. Well, we haven't talked about the budget and haven't talked about overall numbers, but it's probably too mm-hmm. late in the, in the uh, segment. No, to I, into can that. you give, it, give, it, give us some of the numbers as we've got some time? Yeah. Of course, the good things you've heard about, I mean, we're $1.6 billion in capital expense funds. We're about a billion over on general fund revenue. But let's let's talk about uh, some of the things that we got to take a look at. You've already heard from others talk about PERS. We're talking about $260 million plus to the state on that. We've talked about inflation for a lot of our agencies. That's going to have to be looked at. We've talked about, uh, I'm interested, in, again, in doing more for infrastructure in our state, more investment in our state when we have one-time mm-hmm. funds. Let's put those into projects that will last a long, long time. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in the tax rebate. That's going to be my proposal is about $250 million. I'm interested in, um, and we got to look at a few things that are, you know, concerns, deficits this year are probably bigger than ever. I mean, we've got one from the Department of Corrections. It's $23 million for medical care. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's a big uh, cold water dumped on the head on that one, too. And then, of course, Paul, we've got, you know, we will not do, or at least I hope we don't do any bonds this year. I think that's one of the great things our listeners need to know is we've been very good about we're not taking on any debt. And we have for the major project um, uh, Steel Dynamics, but we're looking to even relieve some of that. And so I'm I'm very proud of the fact that we've been uh, fiscally conservative, and I think it's paying off now because we're able to do things, pay for things out of our own pocket and not put them on the credit card. Are you satisfied where the – are you satisfied with the progress is as far as the ARP money or the federal dollars that they're getting dispersed as they should? Uh, mostly, yes. I mean, I hear one or two mm-hmm. tales of things we need to work on, and, and we knew that going into it. I mean, when you can't spend $1.5 billion and not expect that there are going to be a few little glitches, but I hear I get a lot of comments and compliments on uh, what we did. There, there are a couple of things we need to go back and look at, and I've already spoken with Senator yep. Bolt, who chaired that subcommittee and we're going to work on those and then we've got about another 300 million plus to to dole out this year or soon um, of ARPA funds so that's that's next on the table Hmm. 
So what I'm hearing from your offices then and from your committee, I, I would think, is that there probably is not going to be another a, a big movement from the Senate to mess with the personal income tax itself and that uh, what was done last year. Yeah, we, we made the right step. And keep in mind, that's not that has not mm-hmm. even kicked into our state budget. That's going right. to be a $185, $200 million hit to the state budget. Some of that will return because I think people will spend the money, and that's a good thing, and helping yeah. to you know, pump, prime the pump on the economy, just like the tax rebate will. So that will help out. That's why we need three hours on this program. We just cover so many different things. Rick, thank you, man. I appreciate it very much.